Welcome to Go After Dark. In Go After Dark, we code real-time graphical effects and only use the race detector to check if our code is fast enough. Today we'll be drawing 2D sprites, we'll be checking different methods of drawing and comparing them in terms of speed and quality. In the end, we should end up with the nice seasonal effect you see behind me. A good versatile sprite draw can be really useful. For example, it's used in one of my all-time favorite intros called Björ, that almost entirely is made with sprites. The code you'll see is done in grayscale, but what we're doing can actually be done just as easily in full color. With all that said, let's get into the code. Surprisingly, maybe the hardest part of this is the actual preparation of drawing stuff. That means the actual mapping, which pixels should go away. To define that, we have uh, a struct here that uh, contains several fields. It contains the uh, start x and y coordinates, the end x and end y coordinates. That's the coordinate on the screen where we'd like our output to be drawn. The next part is the texture coordinates where we want to read our source data from. Uh, here we store it as fixed point coordinates. We have u0, which is the left x. We have v0, which is left y. We have u1, that is right x. And we have v1, which is the bottom of our texture. Furthermore, we have a v-step and a u-step, which is the number of texture coordinates to increment at every pixel we draw. Finally, we store the size of our texture that we want to draw, so we can check against that, and we store the actual texture that we'll be drawing from. Before we move on, however, I think we should take a look at this in a more visual way. So here we have a gopher that we want to, uh, to draw. The gopher is a sprite, and the canvas is the screen we want to draw to. So the top left corner are the UV texture coordinates we want to start reading from, and the bottom right is, is where we want to end. We can scale the gopher up and down in size. So that means uh, we can have it offset, and you can see it's snapping to whole pixels right now, but we want to also be able to place it between individual output pixels. So in this case, we uh, want to send the center coordinate and we want to send the size of the gopher we, we want to, uh, to draw. The interesting part comes in when we look at cropping. So if we move out here, we can see this part of the uh, overlap that shouldn't be drawn. So that means we have to move our texture coordinate in regards to which part of the image is being cropped. So that is for the top and the left side. On the, uh, on the other hand, we want to stop early if we move the gopher outside the image. So we need to compensate the sizes for, uh, for these cases. So let's take a look at how that would look in the code. So this function calculates the mapping. We give it the center x and y coordinate. We give it an r. Technically, it's not a radius. So it's the width and height of the image. We assume square images. So that means r is the axis aligned distance from the center to the edge of the sprite. Furthermore, we have a parameter called MIP. We'll not care about that right now. So the first thing we do is to see if we are completely outside the, uh, the screen. In that case, we can just return immediately because we don't have to do anything and it shouldn't end up being drawn. Then we have another special case for very, very small sprites, meaning it's a two by two square or less. This means we can uh, simply calculate what should be drawn and have a, a specialized routine do that for us. Next, we skip a little bit 
So we get down to the part where we calculate the ratio between the output pixels and the texture pixels. We then determine where we should start drawing the, the image and also where we should end drawing the image. Then we get to a fairly tricky part where we determine the initial U and V coordinates. The reason we need all these calculations is that we are starting to the left of where we actually might want the sprite to be drawn at. This also means that we have to compensate in the texture, so we are starting slightly inside the texture. The reason we do this is because we want the radius to be more than a fixed integer, so we can scale it more smoothly up and down, and also that we can put the sprite anywhere we want, and the motion will be smooth as well. So we have these two big blobs of calculations where we calculate the left top side and the bottom right side. Then we calculate the step size for each output pixel in each direction. We have some sanity checks in here that we can enable when we're tweaking it. That prints out debug statements if there should be anything that's weird. Then we start the clipping process meaning we check if we are starting to the left of the image, we're starting above the image, if we're ending outside the right side of the image, and finally, if we are ending below the image. So what we do is we then adjust uh, the coordinates and the start and end positions, so we know we won't draw outside our image. Finally, there's some extra sanity checks that uh, can enable if you are experiencing weird stuff. I left it in here just for convenience. But now we're done, so we can start drawing our sprites. So the first method of drawing is uh, what's called a nearest neighbor. It's very fast. So the first thing we do is we calculate our mapping. We set V to the left side of the texture. We figure out where we want to start drawing. We fetch the line from the texture we'll be reading from. We set the U coordinate to the left side of the texture. And we go from start X to end X. We simply discard the high part of the texture coordinates. We look it up and we add it to the existing pixel value. That means it's drawn additive to the, to the current image. Then we increment U and we increment V for every line. So that is actually enough to draw our pixel. Let's take a look at how it looks. I made this small test setup so it's easy to evaluate movement and scaling. As we can see, the effect is really fast and uh, looks fairly okay. There's some shimmering when uh, movement is going on, but it's very, very fast and uh, looks decent and will work in some cases. However, if we try to switch it over to the scene we'll be drawing, here we can see that it's very, very shimmery and very, very unclear what's going on. It's just flickering a lot. So let me introduce you to another concept called mipmaps. So a thing you can do to avoid having very shimmering downscaled versions of your image is to use mipmaps. Basically, it can choose downscaled versions of your image. So here we have the full image. Then we scale it down by 50%, 50% again, 50% again. And based on the size, we choose which of these images to use as a source texture. So that is the part that's going on here. We check the size of the image we want to draw and we choose the appropriate mipmap. If we go up to the top, there's a piece of code that actually creates the mipmaps after the source texture has been loaded. So what this does is simply to scale down until we have a one by one pixel, which is our lowest mipmap level. So the only thing that has actually changed in this piece of code is that we are now allowing it to choose any MIP level where up here in the other one, we always chose the, the best quality texture as input. And the actual drawing code is exactly the same as before, meaning it should perform at exactly the same speed as the other code. So 
Let's enable it and take a look. There we go. It's now shimmering way, way less than it uh, did before. It's not super perfect, but considering that it's drawing at exactly the same speed as before, it's a very, very cheap way of getting some decent scaling images. One thing to note is that it doesn't handle upscaling, meaning if you are going to draw sprites that are bigger than the input, it will still be the same quality as before. But overall, a very, very cheap and very effective way of drawing pixels that sort of look okay when scaled up and down. But finally, let's look at how we can make it even better with some filtering. So let's go through how we draw nice or let's call them bilinear interpolated sprites. First part is the same as always. We calculate the mapping. We go from start Y to end Y. We find where we'll be drawing. Then we find two lines instead of one. So we find two adjacent lines in the input texture that we want to interpolate between. Then we calculate the weight of these two lines. Since we are drawing an uh, entire line, the weight between these two inputs will be the same for the entire line. We have to handle the case where we are at the edge of the sprite, so we don't read outside the sprite. Finally, we reset U as we usually do. Then we range over the width we want to draw. Again, we find two coordinates. We find the pixel to the left, we find the pixel to the right, and we calculate the weight between them. So if we are all, all on the left pixel, we take everything from that. If we are all on the right pixel, we take everything from that. And in between is, well, in between. So we calculate these weights, we look up the four pixels we're interested in, and we apply the weights to each of them. We add them together, the weights are fixed point with, with 8 bits of fraction. So that means when we multiply them, we are actually scaled up by 16 bits. So we compensate for that and we add it to the existing screen value. So let's take a look at how that will end up looking. So now we can see we have nice and smooth motion. We have nice smooth scaling with no weird artifacts. We use the MIP maps, so we don't have to care about more than two pixels. And we can see that everything is handled fairly decently. Let's take a look at how the final scenes look with this. So yeah, now we have nice smooth motion and things are falling nice and calmly from the sky. <laughs> we still have a frame rate around 1100, so performance seems to be okay, though it's not as fast as the pure MIPMAP solution. But just for fun, let's try to uh, use the, the Go scalers for this. And with the Go scalers, it's um, problematic. We, we often can't hit our 60 frames per second, so things are getting very choppy. Also, it doesn't have sub-pixel precision, so the uh, output images are moving single pixels at the time, which doesn't look very smooth. So yeah, doing some of our own stuff can definitely help sometimes. Thank you for watching the sixth episode of Go After Dark. It's been a while since we've seen each other. If you have any feedback, feel free to leave it in the comments below. In particular, if you'd like more detail or less detail, or if you have any topics you think we should cover. In the next episode, I'll try something new. I found some source code from an intro I wrote in 1999, and I think it could be fun to try to recreate the effects in that in Go. Until then, you can visit afterdark.classpost.com to see the source code or see the effect running in a browser. Be sure to subscribe and enable notifications so you get notified when new episodes are out. You can also follow me on Twitter, where I will post as well. On Twitter, you can also share your creations with the hashtag 
go after dark. But thank you for your time. Happy holidays and good night.